Okay, good morning everybody. Um, it's fantastic to see you all here. And as Graham said, it's, it's wonderful to be able to stage this event and have every, everybody together. Uh, we're delighted that you've made the time to come along and lend your support to this idea that we need to start really building resilience into our, into our pasture-based farming systems. So that's what our big focus is here today and tomorrow. Um, I'll first start by offering some appreciation. Thank you very much to our kamatua um, uh, from Ngāti Karaki Kahuhua. I don't know if I said that correctly, but uh, we very much appreciate your welcome. Um, and you remind us that, uh, that, that Māori understand the concept of resilience really well. Um, and it's something that we are relearning in a way in our own society and industry society. Thank you very much for your, for your welcome. Um, so I have been given the question of why we are here. Um, so let me, let me try and make a, provide a little bit of context for the event um, and an attempt to answer the question of why we're here. So at the first level, I think most of us would be here because we are um, passionate about grassland farming in New Zealand that we recognise how important grassland farming and pastures and pasture-based farming systems are to the New Zealand economy, uh, to our environment and to our social structures. So um, I believe that we're all committed to ensuring the best futures for our pasture-based industries. So that's, you know, that's the tradition of the New Zealand Grasslands Association. And the association provides a wonderful vehicle for us to continue to work together to develop our knowledge and practices of grassland farming. So, you know, in many senses, this is a continuation of, of the, the good work that the Grasslands Association does. But I, I believe that all of you would agree that we are here also because we're seeing big changes confronting our grassland farming industries today. Um, I wouldn't use the word unprecedented because we have, the industries have faced major times, major changes in the past, but certainly very, very major changes uh, driven by well, the obvious ones in um, increasing legislation as to how we manage our farm systems, uh, take care of fresh water, manage soils, increasingly greenhouse gases become a major challenge for us. Uh, but also we now see the effects of the physical climate and the changes in the physical climate that are affecting the, the ability to grow and manage pastures as we have in the past. And these are very real and you'll hear over the next couple of days from farmers the very um, uh, types of problems that this has created. Or, or problems, challenges, and questions that it is, it is posing for our farmers. And so another major reason why we're here, I'd like to propose, is that we are here for farmers. We are here for those who are managing the land, uh, making decisions, um, and that has to be uh, our primary. We need to keep that very much in our minds, that it is the farmers and those managing the land um, that are going to need to be supported through the, the, the changing times ahead. So those are just some general comments. There are two, perhaps more specific things that, um, that we're here to do. Uh, one is to share our knowledge, experiences, perspectives and views. That's always been a tradition in grasslands conferences and I'm sure this will be no different. So, so please let's, uh, let's take the, the great opportunity that we're here together to do that. Uh, the second is we are, as Graham alluded to, we're going to finish the conference with a, a workshop on the final day. And that workshop is a little bit like taking stock of where we're at at the moment with um, our ability to manage into the future for the challenges that we're seeing ahead. Um, so uh, one of the things that we need to do in taking stock is maybe just provide a little bit of context about how we're going to do that. And so what I thought <coughs> we might do, bear with me, um, is that we might just run a bit of a job description for pastures in New Zealand uh, and work through some of the context surrounding that job description. So here's my and I want you to think about this, and as Graham said, capture notes and thoughts as we go through this event because they can feed back into work, the work we do in the workshop tomorrow. So here's my first cut at what a job description for New Zealand pastures might, might look like, and I hope you can see that, that, uh, that writing if it's sufficiently large. So first off, of course, they're there to feed a large number of livestock, um, and these are rough figures. I don't put my hand on my heart for any of the figures that you see on the slides coming up. They're approximations in many cases. Several of them I've drawn from papers that are being presented in this, in this conference uh, and will be presented in the proceedings. But they are rough numbers, but you get, you get the idea. 
Um, we ought to remember that pastures actually process pretty much all of the carbon, nitrogen and water that are flowing through. In this case, we're interested in about 10 million hectares of New Zealand land. So that's an important point to bear in mind. Water, carbon and nitrogen are all major environmental factors and pastures basically process this. They assimilate them, they transfer them, they, uh, they mobilise them and so on. So they're a major player in everything to do with environment. And increasingly, of course, we recognise that soil carbon and carbon sequestration is a big part of that job as well. So when you look nationally, and Louis Shipper and others will talk about this later today, is that pastures in New Zealand are assimilating as a net around about 30 million tonnes and holding a soil carbon balance that is more or less stable over time. Ideally, we would like to see that soil carbon balance increase. That would be a major contribution towards greenhouse gas targets. Pastures do us a big favour. They bring in about 350,000 tonnes of nitrogen per year nationally through biological nitrogen fixation, something we've possibly lost a little bit of focus on in recent years. They support about 30 billion in export earnings for New Zealand. This one's a hard one to put a, put a figure on, but there's no doubt that many of New Zealand's high value animal protein products are attracting a premium in our international markets. And many of the users of our products for further product development use pasture fed um, from New Zealand as part of their branding and their marketing. So there is something in there that Pastures is doing that is contributing to premium product, premium pricing for much of our product in the international market. And of course, we must always remember that international competitiveness in these industries very much depends on our ability to grow and utilise pasture by direct grazing. That's a truism that has been um, so fundamental to the development of our industries and will not change. Okay, so we better have a look at the terms and conditions of the job description because that's, that's part and parcel of appraising how we're going. So hours of work are pretty long. Um, there's no sick leave. If, the part, if you're down, um, you're gone, basically. Um, you'll be replaced by somebody else. The payment, uh, well, moderately generous, about 450,000 tonnes of nitrogen, quite a few hundred thousand tonnes of phosphorus, potassium and various other nutrients. No dispute resolution procedures, we just need to get on with the job here and get it done. Medical insurance, uh, well, there's a few remedies that are available at cost, um, endophytes, pesticides, herbicides. Um, we wouldn't forget that publicly funded medical remedies include some, bio, some impressive biocontrol work that's been done over the years. This is all part and parcel of helping maintain productive pastures. Learning and development allowance. I'll come back to this in a minute, but it's about $7 a hectare per year. Um, I want to touch on that in a moment. And you may quibble with my calculation, but I'll put it up there anyway. So let's, let's just note a couple of points of performance relative to the job description. Feeding and international competitiveness. Remember, those were pretty big items in the, in the job description. So for my own industry that I work in, in the dairy industry, we have some concerns that we're seeing performance start to lag here. And Mark Neal will turn talk more about this later today, but if you look at some information that's come from an analysis that David Becker did recently, uh, this is looking at compound annual growth rates in pasture eaten on dairy farms in a number of similar pasture-based production industries around the world. And you can see that New Zealand is barely, we're barely scraping above zero. And if you, you think of some of our competitor countries, Australia, South Africa, even Argentina, the evidence suggests they're doing better at pasture eating than, than we are on our dairy farms. So that has to be a concern for competitiveness. Response to organisational change. So here's a few comments about how pasture is doing in regard to response to organisational change. We've done a lot of good work on nutrient and sediment loss, but more work is going to be needed. We need an action plan for methane reduction. And generally, you'd have to say that our climate change preparedness with pasture solutions is underdeveloped. So let's have a look at the few comments on the performance review relative to terms and conditions. The first point, unfortunately, is that you're in for a pay cut in farming and pastures because we now have a restriction on nitrogen fertiliser use. It's not going to affect every pasture, but it's going to affect some pastures, and one might speculate that it is a, a, a start down a pathway that we may see more of. Medical insurance. 
so some remedies are, are no longer available, unfortunately, um, and there's pressure on others. So we might be expecting further restrictions in the future. And we have to confront the fact that the learning and development spending, even at $7 a year, is viewed pretty unfavourably by some court in some quarters. So this learning and development spend, I've pulled out a figure of $7. So the, an estimate of investiture, investment in research and development directly, directly focused on pasture productivity. It's a hard to get a figure on it, but it seems to be somewhere in the order of about 70 million per year, which sounds a lot. But over 10 million hectares, that boils down to about $7 a hectare. And if you recognise that the meat products, the meat and milk products that are being produced off those 10 million hectares are bringing in about 3 billion, 30 billion a year, sorry, that's about $3,000 a hectare. So $7 a hectare relative to 3,000 is five-eighths of not very much, 0.23%. Now, I don't know, is that the right number? Is that the right number for an, of investment for, an, for a, a sector like ours that is producing so much and doing so much for the economy. And we also mean to bear in mind that a third of that spend is in commercial plant breeding. So when you take the more, I put it in brackets, discretionary public and industry levy funding, the scope for addressing the problems ahead of us is limited. And so maybe we need to be thinking about completely different ways of approaching uh, or attracting and managing the investment we've got and indeed growing that investment. So that's something just to keep in the back of your mind, perhaps, as we go through. Is the system we've got at the moment in New Zealand in which there is enormous inertia, basically, to get change, is it going to lead to better outcomes for us, or do we need to think about this completely differently? Just some general context to finish with then. So we need to, we need to bear in mind that our, our pasture systems in New Zealand are unique. Um, Steve Goldson and others have coined the term ecological outlier in relation to understanding the susceptibility of New Zealand pastures to pests and predator-prey relationships and those kinds of things, which is fascinating work. And I know from talking to experience, very experienced people like Alan Stewart that for some of our regions, it is, there are very few, if any, good climatic matches around the world that we can look to for improved germplasm, for example. So all of this implies that our solutions will need to be homegrown, and I think finally we do need to remember that solutions now we are solving for many factors. 20 years ago at this conference of this sort we might have been solving for production and profit, probably production, um, and a little bit of profit. But now we've got production, profit, we've got nutrients and freshwater quality, greenhouse gases, animal care, and so on. And no one solution that we develop for any one of these problems can make any other problem worse. It's basically a problem solution now that is more constrained than would have been the case in the past. And of course the climatic and regulatory environment is changing very rapidly at the same time. So that's a bit of context, um, a job description, tempted, some terms and conditions, some changes, some context. Um, and all of these things will be covered as we go through the conference. And they are all factors that we need to address when we think about what is the future for grassland farming and pasture productivity, pasture resilience, we've used the term pasture resilience because we're beyond just productivity now, we're into true resilience for pasture based systems. And my final comment then, so uh, just to hit back on Graham's point, we're going to the workshop on the second day, um, please record and keep, capture your thoughts um, and be prepared to bring those to the discussion tomorrow and also feed them into the discussion, panel discussion and other opportunities during the, the day and a half before we get to the workshop session. This is your conference to a large degree to help shape how we're going to move in the future. And we need your ideas. We need ideas and input to make this work. So my final comment just to say is that let's not forget that we're here largely to help the future of these people, our farmers who are working doing the hard yards but also making the hard decisions on farms day by day. Thank you very much.